All right, so I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I've met all of you, but in case you forgot, my name's Nick. Um, second year at Azusa Pacific. And what we're going to do for you today is just kind of go over a upper quarter eval for the shoulder and kind of just the systematic approach to how MSI kind of looks at an upper quarter and looking at the movements and all that stuff. So Dr. Salazar is going to be our patient today. He has um, right anterior shoulder pain, uh, dull and achy nature, and he gets it when he's reaching behind the car and then using the tennis racket to, to hit the tennis ball. And obviously, he's a PT here. Um, characteristics, 5'6", a little bit smaller build, and no, that's not to make fun of his height. That's just kind of a... Uh, uh, kind of gets him into more being prone to use overhead movements and stuff like that versus someone who's a little bit of a taller stature. And then hobbies include tennis, basketball, swimming, playing sports. And then for an outcome measure, we did the, the PSFS. And he was five for playing tennis and six for swimming. And in case you guys aren't familiar, which I'm sure most of you are, a zero on the PSFS is unable to perform the activity and a 10 would be able to perform the activity without any difficulty. So he's about right in the middle in terms of doing both of those activities. All right, and then just some habits that Dr. Salazar usually does is just kind of get you thinking about what we're, we're doing. He likes to sleep prone with his hands kind of behind his back and then stands, I'm sure you've noticed, he likes to stand a lot like this. All right, and then so when he's ready, we're going to start, and basically what we start with is the alignment. So we're going to start with just resting alignment, looking at basically the whole, you know, back, shoulder, scapula, all that stuff. All right, so what we kind of look at first is just basically how does the cervical spine kind of sit along with the thoracic spine and the lumbar, kind of just your general overall picture. So first, what we can kind of tell is we're already in a little bit of, there you go, cervical extension, but a little bit flat through there, but also... What's really kind of noticed is the flat thoracic spine, as well as kind of the loss of, of lordosis with the uh, lumbar spine as well. So that's kind of just our, our general alignment. Now we're going to start looking at, make sure everyone can see the, the shoulder and the scapula. So first what I start with is just looking at our, our angles in terms of looking at do we notice any kind of depression on one side versus the other. And actually kind of you can tell a little bit that the the left is actually a little bit lower than the right in terms of just our slope here. Next, what we're going to do is look at kind of elevation and depression as well. So what I do is kind of find, can you go ahead and just bend down? Perfect. And find, come back up, find C6, C7, and then come down, T1, T2, and T3 right there. So that's T3. And then what we're going to do is find our spine of the scapula right there. Good. And as you can kind of tell, that's a little bit lower then T3 on the left, just something to kind of note. Resting alignment should be about T3 for the spine of the scapula. And then find it on the right. Good, and that's about even on the right. So a little bit lower on the left and the right, although the, the right is the side of pain. And next, what we're going to do is I look at the downward, upward and downward rotation of the scapula. So basically, you can kind of take two fingers and kind of just go right along the medial border of the scapula. And normal resting alignment would be basically just a vertical line between the medial border. Okay, and as you can kind of tell here, I would go ahead and consider that vertical. So that's normal in terms of our resting alignment. And then finding the medial border on the right. Good, and that's a little bit vertical, if not maybe about five degrees of upperly rotated. But upperly rotated within five degrees is okay. That's still considered normal, okay? And next, looking at scapular ab and adduction, so versus how close it is to the spine, we're going to look, I kind of pre-measured my four fingers is about three inches, and three inches is considered normal resting alignment from the spinous process to the medial border of the scapula. So go ahead and just come in right there. Good, and that's about normal. About both, all four of my fingers can kind of fit right in there. And then come to the right as well. And good. And that's about within normal resting alignment as two. So no real kind of anything abnormal in terms of our ab and adduction of the scapula. Next, what we're going to look at is anterior tilt. So basically over the, if you think about the medial lateral axis, your kind of anterior tilt would be this way. Normal resting alignment for the anterior tilt is about 10 to 15 degrees. And what, <laughs> and then um, you can kind of just get a feel in terms of do you kind of feel a little bit of a slope there. And also kind of something you can look at for your anterior tilt is the prominence of the inferior angle. 
So if we have the inferior angle kind of sticking up or it's a little bit more posterior, that gives you an indication that there is some you know, maybe excessive anterior tilt of the scapula. And with Michael, we can kind of see that, first of all, the inferior angles aren't that prominent. And just kind of getting a feel, I, I would say that he's about within normal in terms of our anterior tilt. Okay, and then next what we're looking at is scapular internal rotation. So basically, if you think of kind of like winging, except winging um, for MSI purposes, we only refer to winging as a pathological, so like a long thoracic nerve injury versus just considering like um, internal rotation be the same position, just not pathological. And normal of internal rotation would be 40 degrees from the frontal plane, so this way. So you can kind of just get a sense here, feeling the angle there, and I'll kind of come this way too so everyone can kind of see. And a little bit, it's, it's minute, but you can kind of see that the right scapula is a little bit more internally rotated than the left, and we'll kind of look at it from a different view a little bit later on, and we can kind of see that as well. Okay, so that's kind of our scapula. And then just again, general kind of purposes looking at the olecranon, are we facing posteriorly or a little bit lateral, which would be normal, looking at our arm windows and all that stuff. And everything kind of with him maybe a little bit uh, narrow arm window on the right, but nothing kind of too abnormal. So what we'll do here is I'll have you go ahead and face that. Or yeah, let's face that way. Perfect. Okay, so now looking more at the shoulder itself, what we're going to look at is basically find the anterior lateral portion of the acromion. So right there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to find the humeral head. Good. So we're about right there. Normal would be no greater than one-third anterior of the humeral head. So what not, let's rephrase that. No greater than one-third of the humeral head being anterior to the portion of the acromion. So if we're more than one-third of the humeral head anterior to that point, that would be considered abnormal and it would be kind of an indication for an anterior glide of the humerus. Good. And we're right about there. And as you can kind of tell, he is a little bit more anterior. So I would, get, I would say that is more anterior than one-third of the humeral head. Okay? And then just something to look at here as well, just looking at the distal humerus versus the proximal humerus, are we in vertical or is the elbow or the distal humerus a little bit more posterior? And again, that can kind of give us an indication that the shoulder is a little bit more anterior. And with him, it is pretty vertical. I would say we do have a little bit, he's kind of correcting it a little bit now, but a little bit more kind of posterior with the distal humerus versus the proximal. And then last one, I'll have you go ahead and face there. And just kind of getting a look at our, our clavicles, um, looking at the upward slope and if we have any you know, horizontal or not. And as you can kind of tell, if you guys can see with the lighting, we actually the left is a little bit more horizontal than the right. And that kind of fits with what we found with the posterior aspect that the spine of the scapula is a little bit lower on the left side. But again, that's not really the side of pain. So just something to note that maybe we do have a little bit of depression on the left side. Okay. All right, and then now what we're going to do is we're going to start with our standing tests. So the first one we do is bilateral shoulder flexion. So I'll have you face that way. And then all I want you to do is just bring those arms up as high as you can. Good. And first of all, do you have any symptoms in this position? No? Okay. So first, just checking. Go ahead. Can you do that one more time for me? First, just checking. Does he go up in humeral lateral rotation or medial rotation? And with him, we were up in lateral rotation, so that's a check. Next, what we're looking at is our upward rotation of the scapula. Um, 55 to 60 degrees of upward rotation with full shoulder elevation is considered normal. So what we're going to do, we can find the medial border here and basically kind of just make like a 90 degree angle and then take where that medial border is and kind of find if that is 55 to 60. And I would, I would go ahead and say that that's not. We're a little bit short. I would say maybe 45, if that. So that's kind of a check for lack of full upward rotation of the scapula. And we'll come back down. And then can you go ahead and do that for me again? Now the next time we kind of look at our glenohumeral creases, do we have a little bit of asymmetry with the creases? And I think we do actually a little bit. I see a little bit less of a crease on the right side than I do on the left. And that crease kind of indicates that we have a little bit more superior glide of the humerus or lack of inferior glide with the humerus. Okay. And then last thing in this position, we're looking at the acromions here. And does the acromion get to C6, C7? That's considered normal for full scapular elevation during shoulder elevation. And with him, I'll find the acromion right there. 
Good. I would say that he does get full scapular elevation. We're able to get the acromion to C6, C7. And then lastly, if you come down, can you come down nice and slope? We'll do that one more time for me. And here we're just looking, do we get any anterior tilt or internal rotation as we lower? I don't know if you could kind of tell right towards the end, we do get a little bit more internal rotation right there. Yeah, you see, you see that? Okay, and that is considered abnormal, but also kind of realize that if the scapula is already resting in internal rotation, that might just be going back to the resting position, and it might not be excessive internal rotation as we lower. Okay, so that's our tests. So we went ahead and kind of found two things. We found scapular internal rotation, and we found a lack of upward rotation. So now we're going to kind of do a secondary correction to see if we can change it a little bit. He didn't have pain in this position doing it the, the first couple times, or did you on the second time? On the lowering? Okay, all right, so a little bit on the lowering. So we're going to see if we can kind of change that pain a little bit now. Okay, so what we're going to do, I'm just going to come in and I'm just going to give him a little bit more assist into upward rotation and see if that changes at all. Okay, so go ahead and lift again. Good, and no pain there. Okay, it wasn't hurting before. Good, and then let's go ahead and lower. Good, okay, and now since that one didn't really change the pain because the upward rotation is on the elevation, now we're going to look at maybe if we can change the scapular external rotation on the way up and the way down and see if that changes the pain at all. So now what we're going to do is basically just put our hand kind of on the medial portion and kind of give that scapular a little external rotation. So go ahead and come on up. Good, and then as we lower, go ahead and lower nice and slow. Good. Does that change your pain at all? It did. It got better? Good. Okay, so that's kind of a check that with an assist into scapular external rotation, we were able to change his pain. So that's kind of a check for we do have some scapular internal rotation going on. Okay, and then the next standing test we'll do is just elbows by side, shoulder external rotation. Good. And do you have any pain in that position? A little bit in the front? Good. So what we're looking for here is do we, first of all, have any early scapular adduction? So any scapular adduction within the first 50 degrees of the range, normal external rotation in this position is about 60 degrees. So if we have scapular adduction within the first 50, that's considered abnormal. And then what we're going to look for, again, we had pain. So also when we do that, maybe you can face this way and see, do we kind of have that little bit of anterior collider? Do we get any uh, horizontal abduction or glenohumeral extension when we do that too? So go ahead and try that again. Good, and he does get a little bit, you can kind of see extension there. So again, pain in the anterior location, again, kind of gives us an indication that we have that shoulder a little bit more anterior than the elbow itself, okay? So what we're going to do, now we're going to try to change the pain. So what I want you to try to do is keep those elbows by the side, and then try to just move through the arms and keep the scapulas right where they are, okay? Good, did that change your pain at all? It did, it got a little better, okay. So again, that's kind of a check for when we were able to correct the pain, keeping the glenohumeral from extending, that's kind of a check for our anterior glide as well, okay? And then next test we're gonna do is, well, we can go back and face that way. We're gonna do shoulder abduction, okay? So go ahead and come on up. And basically we're looking for the same things in this that we did in the other one. And as we can see, a little bit less of a crease on the right as well with the glenohumeral, so that's Again, giving us an indication that we might have a lack of inferior glide of the right humerus, okay? And that, any pain with that one? No? Okay, perfect. So that's kind of our standing tests. Now what I'm going to kind of just show you is what we're kind of thinking based on the quick subjective, the alignment, and the standing test of kind of giving you an idea of what kind of three hypotheses we're thinking. First, we have the humeral anterior glide and then the scapular internal rotation with insufficient upward rotation. Usually the humeral diagnoses are coupled with a scapular diagnosis. So when you have shoulder pain or a shoulder diagnosis, it's usually um, with a comp compensatory scapular um, diagnosis as well. And that's basically based on the location of pain, the aggregating factors of overhead movements, as well as the ability to um, correct the pain with scapular upward rotation or scapular external rotation. And then also, just kind of considering as well that it might be humeral medial rotation, um, just based on the anterior, the pain in the anterior shoulder, worse with overhead movements. He's like, um, he likes swimming. Swimmers often tend to have a little bit more medial rotation based on like 
you know, the strokes that they do, a freestyle stroke, they tend to medially rotate a little bit more. So that's a possibility. And as well as humeral superior glide, which is, again, based on the anterior location of the pain, the lack of the inferior glide, um, which we noticed in both shoulder flexion and shoulder abduction. And then, again, patient is a swimmer, that, that tends to be part of it as well. Although, I do have to say, superior glide might be a little less likely. We tend to see the superior glide with a rotator cuff injury or anything like that when we're hiking the shoulder to try to get it up. Okay? So next, now we're going to start with, so we did our standing tests, we did our alignment, now we're going to do our supine tests. See, we're going to start with the pec minor length. Good. So what we're looking for here, it's hard to see for everyone, but we're looking for the posterior aspect of the acromion. And we're trying to see if that posterior aspect of the acromion is within one inch of the table or not. Normal would be within one inch of the table. And with Michael, we're a little bit farther than that, so I would go ahead and say that we're not actively within normal functional limits for the pec minor. So now what we're going to do is we're going to try to passively take the muscle into that range and see if we can reach the table with the, mu with the, the passive assistance. So we're going to go right into there, feeling for that posterior aspect. Good. And we're not able to reach the table, so I would consider that muscle short and stiff. So that means that um, we're not able to get the, the full length actively or passively, so that's the short. And then stiffness would be short and stiff combined as we see a compensation with that too. So the muscle's not able to get the full length, and then we're also seeing a compensation. And with him, it was a little bit of trunk rotation as we're trying to passively take him into that motion, okay? So the pec minor would be considered short and stiff, all right? And then the next one we'll do is the pec major length. So we're going to take him into 90 degrees abduction. Go ahead and relax for me. There you go. And then horizontal abduction. And then what we're trying to see is can we get the humerus to the table? Okay, so this is testing at 90 degrees abduction. It's testing the clavicular fibers of the pec major. And with him, we are able to get to the table. So I would consider that portion of the pec major to be within normal limits or normal in terms of our length. And then we're going to go at 120 degrees. And that's testing the sternocostal fibers of the pec major. And that as well, we are able to get to the table, even though the pelvis is kind of in the way a little bit. So again, I would consider that normal in terms of our muscle length for the pec major. Okay. That hurts a little bit. You get the pain right in the anterior. Okay. Good. All right. So then next what we're going to do is testing the muscle length of the lats now. So what we're going to do is first actively, can I have you bring your arm up there? Good, and just checking for full range. And already you can kind of see we have a little bit of elevation of the rib cage here. So that's, again, kind of a compensatory movement. Now we're going to try to do it passively, try to make sure that everyone can see. But I'm going to try to tack down the rib cage now and then kind of take it through the full passive length and see if we're able to get there. Good, and already I can feel I'm not putting too much pressure on the rib cage, just enough that I can feel if the rib cage is moving into my hand. And that I already kind of feel within there. So we're not able to get full shoulder length or shoulder flexion there. So again, I would consider that short and stiff. We're not able to get to the table. And then I feel the compensatory movement of the rib cage pop into my hands. Okay, so lats would be short and stiff as well. Next one we're going to do is the scapular humeral muscles. So that's your infra, your teres major, teres minor, and all those. So what we're going to do, we're going to take our hand and kind of cup the lateral border of the scapula there. And again, not a, not a lot of pressure, just feeling if that scapula is going to pop into my hand and when it does, okay? So we're going to take him into shoulder flexion again here. Good. And already right there, I can feel that the scapula is popping into my hand. And that would be considered already short for the scapular humerals because we weren't able to get as far as we were with the lats, okay? So if we were able to get as far as we were with the lats, then the lats would be the contributing factor. But since we're shorter than the lats, then there is some portion of the scapular humerals that are tight as well. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take them where we were um, with that resistance before I felt that scapula pop, and then we're going to internally rotate him. That's going to basically bias the teres major, and if we're able to get a little bit more range, which we are right there, that would be considered that the teres major would be the shortest and stiffest. So we have um, scapular humerals short and stiff with the teres major being most limited. Okay, so those are our scapular humerals. Now we're going to check the muscle length of the post delt. Okay, so same position with our hand. I'm just kind of cupping the lateral border of the scapula there. And then now we're going to bring him into horizontal adduction. 
So right there, and then bring him. Go ahead and relax for me. There you go. Good. And again, feeling for when the scapula starts to pop into my hand. And normal length in this position would be able to get the nose or the elbow or the olecranon in line with the nose. Okay, and obviously, as you can tell, we're not able to get there. So again, that would be considered short and stiff of the post delt as well. Okay, and then next, what we're going to check while we're here, we'll go ahead and do the the. Oh, we can do that too. And then, so we had the post delt coming through horizontal adduction. Now we're going to check the posterior capsule as well to see if there's any limitations with the capsule. So go ahead and relax for me. There we go. Good. And we do get a little bit more range with the posterior capsule, almost able to get to the nose before I start to feel the scapula. So that just kind of tells us that maybe the post delt is a little bit short and stiff, but a little bit more limited than the actual posterior capsule itself. Okay. And then next what we're going to do is we're going to check the biceps length. Good. So just putting the towel over the distal humerus. And then what we're going to check here is, I'm just going to come down. There we go. Good. So checking the muscle length just in supination first. And again, full length would be able to get full elbow, flex, or elbow extension. Excuse me. And then taking them into pronation to stretch the biceps. Good, and we're able to get that full elbow extension. Any pain in the front of the shoulder with that? No, no pain. Okay, so normal length of the biceps as well. Okay, and the next test we're going to do, I'll have you scoot just a little bit that way. We're going to do our internal, external rotation at 90 degrees abduction. I'm sure you guys have maybe seen us do this before. What we're going to test here is I'm basically putting my thumb and kind of wrapping around the humeral head. And I'm going to take them into shoulder internal rotation passively first and see if I kind of feel the humeral head kind of pop into my thumb. Good. And right there I can already feel. So that is kind of giving me an indication that we already have an anterior glide of the shoulder very early in the range of motion. And then now we're going to have them do it actively. Good. Pain there in the front? Pain. Okay. So now we're going to do a secondary correction to kind of fix that. All we're going to do is say, I start to feel your humerus move right there. Can you go ahead and actively just do it until we start to feel the humerus move? Good. Any pain when you do that at all? No. Okay. So again, we were able to kind of correct the, the pain with a secondary correction, just having him go into internal rotation before the, the humerus starts to glide anteriorly. And then again, now we're going to do it into external rotation. And again, feeling if we have any anterior glide of the shoulder there. Good. Let's just move that towel a little bit. There we go. Good. All right. And then go ahead and do that actively for me. Good. Any pain with that? Good. Okay. And we can even kind of notice that we do have a little bit more or excessive external rotation than we do internal rotation. And that, again, kind of fits with the anterior glide that maybe the posterior muscles are a little bit stiffer, limiting the anterior or internal rotation and giving a little bit exter excessive external rotation. Okay, so those are our supine tests. Now we're going to flip over to prone. And since we basically just did the internal and external rotation tests in supine, now we're going to do it in prone. And this time the towel is going to be a little bit more proximal of the humerus so we can get uh, the humerus and the scapula basically in the same plane. Okay. And then now we're going to go into passive internal rotation. Again, I'm kind of cupping the anterior portion of the humeral head to feel if we have any anterior glide during the, the passive internal rotation. Good. And already I can feel it right there. And again, we might have a little bit more limited internal rotation just because being in the prone, it's a little bit more demanding on the muscles. The scapula is not tacked down on the, the table like it is in supine. So we do expect a little bit less, but go ahead and go for Good, and I already feel. Do you have any pain in that position? A little bit. And again, let's just do that little correction. So go ahead and just go right to there. Good. No pain if you just go? Okay, good. And again, kind of a check with our secondary correction that we were able to change the pain with just limiting the amount of internal rotation that we go. Okay, and then next, we're just going to go into external rotation. Good, and you can kind of feel... For the anterior glide, but also going to feel for the activation of the post delt. Is the post delt kind of dominating over the smaller external rotators, the teres minor, and the infraspinatus? So go ahead and do that again. Good. And a lot of activation of the post delt. Okay. So any pain in that position? No? 
Okay, so that's again just kind of something to note, and that kind of fits the anterior glide syndrome um, that the post delt tends to dominate over the smaller external rotators. Okay, and then next we're going to do a couple muscle performance tests here. First, we're going to do we're going to test the strength of the mid trap. Go. All right, so about 90, 95 degrees of abduction, getting him into full glenohumeral external rotation with the thumb up. And then we're going to adduct the scapula. And then what I want you to do is, can you go ahead and try to hold that position for me? Good. And already we can kind of see a little bit of compensatory movement there. So we're not going to go ahead and add the resistance because he wasn't able to hold the muscle in the correct, or the arm in the correct position to begin with. Okay. And then now we're going to test the low trap. About 120 degrees, again, full glenohumeral external rotation. And now we're going to adduct and depress the scapula right to there. And can you go ahead and hold that for me? Good. And again, we can already start to see that there was a little bit of comp compensatory movement there. So we're not going to continue with the test and add resistance to that. OK, so those are our prone tests. Now we're going to go ahead and go into quadruped. All right, and in quadruped, what we're looking for here is just looking at our tabletop alignment, trying to see if we have um, any thoracic flexion, lumbar flexion, and then also kind of looking at the scapular internal rotation and anything in that position. And we do have a little bit more internal rotation on the right than we do in the left in this position. And then do you have any symptoms in this position? No? OK. And then something that even if they do have symptoms, something that we can help to kind of change the internal rotation would be, can you just bring your hands a little bit wider? Good. So what that does is that brings it into more scapular external rotation, or it decreases the pull of the scapular humeral muscles on the, the scapula itself. So we're giving it a little bit more external rotation. And then again, pretty good in terms of our tabletop alignment. And then what I want you to do is, can you go ahead and rock back for me? Good. And then something to kind of note, you can already see a little bit of early lumbar flexion with him in that position. And then what we've kind of just been doing a lower quarter exam on him previously, and we kind of know that Michael is retroverted. So same thing that applies to the scapula in terms of giving a little bit more external rotation. We can bring his hips a little bit wider there and then go ahead and rock back. And you can tell that we get a lot more range before we have the lumbar flexion. So again, that's just kind of no noting that when we're retroverted, Opening up the hips, giving the hips a little bit more space, we're able to get more range. And that's just kind of something for, you know, your own kind of knowledge in terms of that. Okay, so no pain in this position, just something to kind of note that changing the, the scapular external rotation improved the alignment of the scapula too. Okay, and then last we'll go with our seated test. All right, and we're going to test, yeah, let's... We're going to test the yeah, that's perfect. The strength of the serratus. So what we're going to do, we take him into about 120 degrees of shoulder flexion. Then we're going to have him protract and really get that upward rotation. And then what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to try to push your arm down a little bit. Okay, I want you to hold it right where it is. Okay, ready? Hold, hold, hold. Good. So we were able to break him a little bit. So if we're giving an MMT, I give him a four. But also, my force is about 70% of my force is going to downwardly rotating with only about 30 trying to retract him. And that's because we're more curious about the strength of the serratus in controlling that upward rotation versus trying to worry about the retraction. And that's, again, just based on the fact that we saw kind of uh, insufficient upward rotation in standing. So we're just curious about, does the serratus have enough strength and enough control to hold the scapula in that upwardly rotated position? OK, so that's kind of the completion of our tests. And then what we have, I kind of just put a, made a chart. So these are the three kind of humeral diagnoses that we started with. And I kind of just put a check under um, basically all the evaluative tests that we did um, in terms of, you, as you can see, that the, the anterior glide was definitely the, the most common in terms of positive tests for the anterior glide. So as you can see, that, that is probably what our final movement diagnosis is going to be. And then I also did it for the scapular diagnoses as well. So scapular internal rotation with the insufficient upward rotation um, definitely had the most checks or the most positive tests 
in terms of that being the most likely diagnosis for, for him in terms of our scapular position. So together, the final movement diagnosis would be humeral anterior glide with scapular internal rotation and insufficient upward rotation. Okay? And then now, based on all of that, we're just going to give a brief kind of overview in terms of the contributing factors that we found from the tests. So we have the stiffness or the shortened stiffness of the pec minor, the lats, the scapular humeral muscles, with the teres major being most limited, and then the shortened stiff of the shortened stiffness of the posterior delt. And then with the relative flexibility of the subscapularis or the inner joint flexibility, that's just basically with the PICR or the path of instantaneous center of rotation. That's just our supine internal external rotation test. And the relative flexibility is that we saw that anterior glide early in the range of motion. So we're saying that the subscap is more flexible um, than the posterior muscles or the scapular humeral muscles. So we're getting that anterior glide because the laxity is more anterior and the body kind of takes the path of least resistance. So that humerus is going anterior because of the stiffness of the posterior side. Okay, and then contributing factors, again, just the repetitive overhead movements of tennis and basketball, the habit of sleeping prone with hands behind back, and then again, something to kind of note, just contributing factors in terms of positioning, and for later on with teaching him about kind of proper movements for tennis is the femoral retroversion, retroversion as well. Okay, so focus of treatment. What we're really going to try to work on with Dr. Salazar is, first of all, improving the rotation of the humeral head in the glenoid. So that's your PICR, that's your um, supine internal external rotation test, and just really trying to retrain the humerus to move or spin correctly. Because when we're in that position, we shouldn't get any anterior or posterior glide. The anterior glide and the post should be compensated or should even out with the posterior roll of the humerus. So we should only be getting the spinning. And then obviously we're not getting that because of the, the anterior glide that we noticed early in the range. So that's something for us to work on. And as well, stretching the short and stiff muscles, those kind of scapular humeral muscles, the post delt, all kind of play a contributing factor to that. And um, first of all, the teres major, the scapular humerus, and the post delt, those muscles all do scapular internal rotation. And those muscles are, obviously, we notice the scapular internal rotation as well. So the tightness of those muscles are kind of what's contributing to the scapular internal rotation. And then lastly, just improving the, the recruitment or the strength of the mid-trap, the low-trap, and the subscap as well. Because both those tests, we saw compensation testing the, the mid-trap and the low-trap. We saw compensations. We weren't able to really fully test those muscles. All right, and then something just for him to kind of take home and as long as giving him exercises to help improve, we also want to give him functional things that he can do at home or around the house or at work to kind of help limit the pain as well. The first is limiting the amount of time and activities that the elbow is posterior to the shoulder. If you think about if we're in this position, elbow posterior to the shoulder, we're already kind of feeding into that anterior glide because the shoulder's already more anterior and we can get a little bit more irritation to the structures in the front as well, just being in prolonged positions of that shoulder anterior. And then also changing kind of the way he sleeps, sleeping with pillows under his arms, either in supine or side lying, having him maybe put a body pillow and put his arm on the body pillow is going to give a little bit more cue to an upward rotation or an external rotation at rest. And then also <clears throat> retraining how he moves and how he reaches behind in his car, making sure that if he is just reaching, he's not going into more of that anterior glide to reach, but really getting trunk rotation as well and reaching with a little bit of that is going to help limit the amount of irritation we put on the shoulder. And then also unloading the upper extremities, that's going to help just to basically give those muscles a little bit of, of time to breathe, if you will, or relax, and again get that little bit of upward rotation of the scapula when we're unloading the upper extremities. And then lastly, um, teaching him about swinging the tennis racket, uh, making sure that we get kind of a full weight shift. And again, basically the same as reaching back in the car. We want to make sure that we're not just reaching with our arm, but we're really getting that full kind of trunk rotation and getting the swing. And then something for Michael as well, in terms of the femoral retroversion, is just having a little bit of his toes out. That's going to give the hips a little bit more space 
and put a little bit less stress on the lumbar spine in terms of having to rotate through the lumbar spine because with our toes basically in neutral, he's not able to get as much hip rotation in that position. Okay? So those are kind of our functional modifications. And then lastly, our key exercises. So what I'm going to have, if you're okay, just showing, I'm going to show basically three exercises, kind of the three key main exercises that I would give him day one. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, we can do that one first. So what we're going to do is shoulder flexion facing the wall. So what we're doing is basically ulnar side of the fifth metatarsal on the wall. Elbows are off the wall. And what we're going to do is his cue, we have the scapular internal rotation and lack of upward rotation. So his cue is going to really to try to bring that scapula up and around as he goes into shoulder flexion. Okay, so go ahead and try that for me. And I'm just going to give him a little manual assistance up into that upward rotation. Does that feel okay? No pain there? Good. Okay. So go ahead and lower. And as you lower, try to keep that scapula in um, stable and just try to lower through the arms. Good. And that cue is basically to help. We kind of noticed that this uh, we had a little bit of excessive scapular internal rotation as we lowered in the standing position. So cueing him to hold the scapula is going to help to prevent that excessive internal rotation as he lowers. Okay. Yeah, of course. Good. So we'll go ahead and come on up. Good. And then as he lowers, I'm going to basically do the same as the testing position and give him a little scapular external rotation as well. Good. Does that feel okay? No pain? Good. Okay. So that would be the first exercise I would give him. The second one would be the supine PICR. I'll grab the pillows again. I'll have you scoot a little that way. Good. So basically this exercise is going to be same position as the testing position. And then what I want him to feel is you can even bring his other hand. I really want him to feel when he starts to feel that anterior glide and just training him to do that only until we feel the anterior glide. Because if we're going into excessive anterior glide in that position, that's only going to irritate the anterior structures even more. And again, the idea of this exercise is to be pain-free. But what we're retraining is basically retraining the motor control of the subscap, the internal rotator. And the subscap kind of has the best position in terms of it's closest to the axis of rotation versus the other internal rotators like the teres major or the, the lats or the pec major. So really, again, with the anterior glide, some of the findings from the MSI is that we tend to have over-dominating um, lats, pec major, teres major, over the subscap. So we're getting a lot of kind of out of rotation or out of axis spinning of the glen, of the, the humeral head because the, the subscap isn't doing its job correctly. So that's what we're basically retraining, is retraining the motor control of the subscap here. And also, as we're going into internal rotation, we're also getting a stretch of the posterior muscles as well. Okay? And then again, I would have him kind of hold at the bottom for about 10 seconds to get a little more activation of the subscap there. And about usually we go about 10 reps of 10 second holds. And that'll be kind of um, a good start in terms of retraining the subscap. And then the last test or the last exercise I would give him would be the, the prone mid trap. Okay, so we'll go ahead and have you bring it there. All right, so what we're going to start to do is obviously add a little bit of strengthening to the mid-trap. We noticed with the MMT that we had a lot of compensations and we weren't able to kind of get full um, resistance to the mid-trap. So what we're going to do, this is kind of our first position, and I'm going to have you bring your hands on top of your head here. Very kind of critical that we make sure we're on the top of the head and not behind the head. If we're behind the head, we have a little bit more tendency to further that anterior glide of the shoulder in that position. So we really want to limit that because, again, the goal of this exercise is to strengthen the mid-trap and not add more irritation to the anterior structures of the shoulder. And again, what's good about this position is what we're going to do here is we're already in a kind of an upward rotated position. So when we adduct the scapula, the rhomboids are kind of at a disadvantage because the rhomboids are a downward rotator or in that upwardly rotated position, so we really get a focus more on the mid-trap versus the rhomboids. Okay, so all we're going to do here is I just want you to try to squeeze those shoulder blades together. Good, and hold that for about 10 seconds. No pain there? No pain, good. So again, 
we're just starting to re-strengthen re the mid-trap. The mid-trap is also a scapular external rotator. So again, that's going to help work on the strength of the, the external rotators to help limit the amount of scapular internal rotation that we have. Okay, so those would kind of be the three key take-home exercises that I would give him. And then as you can kind of see, you kind of look at two, kind of a progression of that would be the shoulder flexion standing against the wall. We can add TheraBand, add weights, dumbbells as we start to progress and get a little bit stronger there. This position, we can go from hands on head to arms outside, just lifting up through the arms there. That's a little bit more demand on the mid trap. And then lastly would be full external rotation. And that's kind of our position three. That's even more demand on the mid trap there. So again, you can kind of see the progression in terms of strengthening. And once we get to that position, again, we can add dumbbells or whatever you kind of want to do in terms of strengthening the mid trap. Okay, so those are kind of our three positions and key exercises. I think we're good. And I think that is all we have. Yep, that's it.